Thank you everybody for joining us for our webinar uh, this evening, uh, this morning, if you're in Japan. We have 151 people who have registered to attend uh, this webinar. And uh, while we're waiting for everyone to join, we have a couple of questions that we would like to ask. And the first one is simply, where are you joining us from? And we've broken it down as follows Okinawa. Uh, we'd love to know if you're in Okinawa. Uh, if you're in other parts of Japan, uh, if you're in the United States, or if you're outside of the United States in Japan. And we'll leave this up for about 10 more seconds. And uh, interestingly, we have about 65% from the US right now, uh, and uh, a little over 20% from uh, Okinawa, and a small percentage from Japan, and one person, two people now actually, from outside of both of those countries. I'm going to share these results with everyone. Uh, so you can uh, take a peek at that. Uh, so 56% from the US, 33% from Okinawa, uh, a few people from other parts of Japan, and two people from outside of both countries. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for that. And we have one other poll question uh, that we would like to ask the audience. Uh, it's just simply, how concerned are you? about the impact of climate change on island biodiversity. Extremely concerned, concerned, somewhat concerned, not too concerned, or not concerned at all. Uh, we'd just love to get a sense of um, what the audience thinks about this. We'll leave this up for about uh, 10 more seconds here. And um, we have about 65% extremely concerned, uh, most of the rest concerned, but we do have a few people somewhat concerned and not too concerned. And I will uh, share this uh, with everyone so you can see how the audience feels about this particular topic. Uh, so 60% extremely concerned, 35% concerned, 4% uh, somewhat concerned, and 2% uh, one person not too concerned. Uh, so thank you very much for joining in that poll. And now that we have uh, about 75 people on the line, uh, we will proceed uh, with the webinar. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining in uh, tonight's webinar, or again, this morning's webinar, if you're in Asia. Uh, this webinar, of course, is titled The Future of Biodiversity in the Pacific Region, Conserving a Threatened Island World. I'm David Jaynes of OIST, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology and the OIST Foundation. And this webinar is part of a new three-part webinar series directed by the OIST Foundation, focused on some of the most important global issues of deep concern to the United States and Japan, climate change, environmental conservation, and its impact. This series is supported by a grant from the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership, for which we are deeply appreciative, and also the UC Berkeley Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management is co-sponsoring this evening's webinar. This project will result in a summary report on lessons learned and the future potential directions for, for the OIST Foundation and OIST in these areas. For those who don't know, the OIST Foundation is a US-based 501c3 nonprofit organization that supports scientific breakthroughs, innovation, and the sustainable development of Okinawa through OIST. And OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, is an interdisciplinary graduate school offering a five-year PhD program in science. The main task of OIST is to produce groundbreaking research for the benefit of all humankind. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and is on the record. And I want to let everyone in the audience know that we really want your engagement. So at any time during this webinar, you can ask questions using either the chat feature or the Q&A feature. Uh, and I will be collecting those questions and later on in the evening, uh, we'll get a chance to answer some of those. So please write your questions down at any point in time. Without further ado, let me introduce our very distinguished uh, panelists who are uh, with us tonight. And I really uh, wanna thank all of them for taking time out of their busy schedules uh, to be with us and to explore tonight's topic. Uh, we have with us Dr. Evan Economo, a professor of biodiversity and biocomplexity uh, with that unit at OIST in Okinawa, Japan. He's joining us from Okinawa. He's a biologist with broad interests in ecology and the evolution of biodiversity. He was born in Montreal and grew up in Virginia and North Carolina, 
before pursuing undergraduate work at the University of Arizona and graduate work at the University of Texas at Austin. He was a fellow in the Society of Fellows at the University of Michigan from 2009 to 2012. And since 2012, he's been at OIST where he leads the ARI lab. And I hope all of you on this call get to visit that lab uh, someday. It's pretty amazing. We also are very honored and pleased to have with us two of Evan's close colleagues, Dr. Rosemary Gillespie and Dr. George Rod Roderick. Dr. Rosemary Gillespie is professor and Schlinger Chair of Systematics at the Essig Museum of Entomology at UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on understanding evolutionary patterns and processes among populations and species. And her primary focus, which you'll hear more about tonight, is on islands, particularly remote hotspot islands of the Pacific. Dr. George Roderick is William Maurice Huskins Professor in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. Professor Roderick's research focuses on global change, especially the impact of global biological homogenization caused by biological invasions. His work addresses basic and applied questions, taking advantage of the opportunities associated with the geography of the Pacific Basin, Pacific Islands, Pacific Rim in California. And tonight you're gonna to see a lot of photos of islands in the Pacific. I think we're all gonna to wanna to, want to travel there. Uh, thank you to all three of you for joining us. I'd now like to turn the floor over to uh, Evan Economo. Thank you, David. And uh, just wanna first thank David for organizing this. And uh, thank Rosemary and George for joining me in this. Uh, so the region, and also thank all of you, the attendees, for coming to watch us. So the, what the topic we're obviously going to talk about today is the Pacific region and how the Pacific region uh, is uh, being impacted in this current era of climate change and global change. And we, we're also going to get into what's very interesting biologically and ecologically about the Pacific. Um, as you can see, this is the region we're going to talk about. It's it's really hard to do justice in a two-dimensional map. It covers about half the Earth. And in this vast basin uh, between Japan and the United States, there's a huge network of islands, very, very small land masses, um, really a, a physiographic landscape that is unique uh, compared to anywhere else in the world. And this forms an arena for... <clears throat> for very interesting ecology and evolution uh, to happen and has uh, generated lots of interesting, both landscapes you can see in the pictures, very beautiful landscapes, uh, but also interesting biodiversity. And also wanna mention the human cultures, the, the colonization of the Pacific was one of the great achievements of early human uh, civilization. So um, this provides a, a very, very interesting and informative study area for us as scientists to understand what's going to happen in the future uh, to Earth as a whole. So um, I first want to just ask uh, Rosie and George, uh, maybe give a little bit of background on how you started working in the Pacific. Uh, so maybe to Ro Rosie first. Well, thanks, Evan. Yes, um, it's, it th thanks, everyone, for, for coming and listening to this. I'm actually how, how I got to, to this, where I'm at now is, is it's kind of a circuitous route that comes right the way around the world. I started off in Scotland, I'm from Scotland and went to the University of Edinburgh and then actually um, went on from, from there to um, the University of Tennessee. And that I, was, I studied behavioral ecology in, at the University of Tennessee before coming out to Hawaii. And if we can have the next slide, I went to Hawaii actually to continue work on um, behavioral ecology. And I, was, I came to work on the Hawaiian happy face spider. And so, so this is a very um, charismatic little spider. But um, what, what, what was more exciting to me there when, when, when I arrived was that there was this um, radiation of spiders and this, the long-jawed spiders in the genus Tetragnatha. And, and I, I, I really, you know, I found this radiation. It was just so enthralling and so exciting to, to see all of these species that were so diverse and so unknown. And um, I just became totally captivated in trying to understand what was going on with, with this lineage. And as I was pursuing this, this idea, you know, of just trying to figure out how these spiders had diversified, <clears throat> 
I started to become, of course, more involved in issues of conservation. And during the process, I also became um, involved in, in understanding how entire communities have evolved across the Hawaiian Islands. What's beautiful about the Hawaiian Islands is that they're a chronological arrangement going from the very young islands to the very old. And so you can see how entire communities are put together through time, going from almost zero to five million years. And so this is what, um, what the, the attribute of islands that we've been using and that we'll be talking about a little, little bit more. And so I'll let George introduce himself and just say a little bit more about how he got into this field. So thank you, Rosie, and uh, thank you, Evan. Uh, it's a privilege to be here uh, this evening, this morning. Um, I uh, grew up in Maine, and uh, in, in college, uh, I got interested in um, statistical ecology and uh, especially uh, how we could use insects to um, look at biological processes. And then I did a PhD at Berkeley, and my uh, PhD had to do with uh, dispersal and migration of, of insects, and that's on the upper uh, left there. And then for a postdoc um, I, at the University of Maryland and um, in Washington, D.C., I got involved with the uh, United Nations and FAO and projects in Southeast Asia to look at um, migrations of, of insect pests, especially pests of rice, and these, again, were plant hoppers that have seasonal migrations uh, across Southeast Asia. And uh, back then, um, airplanes did not um, cross the Pacific in one uh, flight, but uh, stopped. And so many of these uh, flights stopped in, in Hawaii, where I became acquainted with um, the biota of Hawaii, but also the invasive species uh, in, in Hawaii and their, and their impacts. And that led me to um, collaborate with Rosie and Evan uh, and, and others on um, invasions of insects and uh, their impacts and, and where they come from. And especially understanding that the world is becoming a smaller place for a lot of invasive species and many of the invasive things that we see uh, are found um, in this case across the Pacific and in many different kinds of habitats. Evan? Yeah, to you. <clears throat> thank you. So um, my, my background is I was uh, I was in graduate school and I was at the time doing theoretical work uh, where I'm basically just writing computer code and, and doing math. And I was asking myself, well, wait a minute, I got into this field because I wanted to get out there and see the world and, uh, and study nature. And I was looking around the world. So I decided I wanted a field system, you know, some taxonomic group, some group of organisms somewhere in the world. And I started looking around in the literature um, and I sort of came across these older papers by a guy named Edward Wilson, who many of you probably know is one of the most famous bi uh, biologists of the last hundred years. Um, and he's most famous for his work in raising the profile of conservation and biodiversity and, and many other things. But actually in, the, in his early days, when he was in his 20s, he did a lot of field work in the um, in the Melanesia area and the Pacific Islands, and and a lot of that work hadn't really been revisited, and that sort of seeded some really interesting questions that came and really interesting ideas that came later in developing our field. But no one had really gone back to that original system of ants in the Pacific, so that's really how I got interested. And I also later found some really good papers by people like and Rosie and George. I remember reading the, you know, about the spiders, the work on spider radi radiations in, in Hawaii as a grad student. And also uh, they wrote a nice uh, uh, definitive piece on arthropods on islands. So, so that got me really, really interested. So I ended up doing a, a big field survey and inventory of all the ant species in the Fiji islands. And I went and lived there for a year and did lots of field work and had lots of adventures, which sort of, uh, check that box for me, but, um, but it was also extremely interesting to find out about all the evolutionary radiations that have happened there. Um, there's lots of species there and, and different lineages there that, that don't occur anywhere else in the world. And also it's really obvious the, the threats that are happening uh, and the impacts that are happening to these islands, which are extraordinarily small. So they're, they're, they're quite vulnerable. So that's, that's my background. And since then, I, I finished my PhD and have been working there ever since. And my lab 
that was one of the one of the interesting things to come to Okinawa was Okinawa is a Pacific island, and uh, and has a lot of the same issues here that we see in further out in the Pacific. So, um, so my lab's been working in uh, across the region on different topics. So, Rosie, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, from a perspective of biology, why are islands so interesting or how why are they useful why should we pay attention so yeah, that's that's a, a great point yes evan um i think probably everyone who's here uh, uh, understands what's so special about islands the thing is you know when you think about what have been the great breakthroughs in biology the i think the main ones you think about of course are dar well first evolution so darwin and wallace and what th this that both of them were based on they 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 kind of ripped, gained their insights by looking at islands and so what they could do was look at one island to the next island and see how taxa had changed how species had changed as you go from one place to the other and Darwin, of course, as you know, looked at how lineages of birds were different and how they were adapted to different f food types, how they lived together and how they'd kind of separated out the niches. So they, they, both of them kind of came to the same idea as to how evolution worked by looking, by, by piecing together the, the relationships amongst these different um, elements of the biota and figuring out how one might have evolved from the other. So islands were foundational in the, the development of the theory of, of natural selection and evolutionary ideas. But we, I think that, that what is, is sometimes forgotten is that actually islands have played a major role in some of the other major theories. Evan mentioned Yeo Wilson. Yeo Wilson also worked with, with Robert MacArthur and together they developed one of the most long-standing theories in ecology, which is the equilibrium theory of island biogeography, which looks at the balance between immigration and extinction on islands. And the important thing here is the use of islands to understand the details of, of the ecology and to understand just what's changing from space to space space place to place and how interactions change how what the details on a spatial scale and what's perfect and ideal about some islands in particular when they're arranged in a chronological framework or, or a spatial framework they allow you to actually look at the integration or the, the intersection of ecology and evolution. You can look at how lineages are changing through time, but also looking at how change is happening over space. And so they're foundational, really. They played a foundational role in the building of these, cons these concepts. And if we go to the next slide, what I want to highlight here is also that this is, this is um, Maui as it was prior to human arrival. So we've said, you know, how critical islands are for understanding these concepts in, in biodiversity and in, in understanding evolution ecology. But the other thing about islands is that they're extremely fragile. They're, they're sensitive to change. They've got small populations. The, the whole issue of conservation is accentuated, is accelerated. If we go to the next slide, David, what you'll see is that this is what Maui looks like today. The red is the, is the modified landscape here. And so we're dealing with a, a small proportion of, of what we started with. And so we really have to, we have to try and understand what is actually happening here, how these communities are changing and how we can stop this kind of huge landslide towards modification and extinction of these environments. And if we go to the next slide, well, just um, the next slide, just what I want to highlight here is that Islands, as I said, they're, they're extremely fragile. They're, we 
desperately need to understand the factors that are underpinning change, that, that are causing ecosystem disruption and, and pre, causing really collapse of ecosystems and, and tipping points. We need to get a handle on this. Islands provide a way to actually, although you know they're extremely they're fragile, their issues are accentuated, accelerated, but they do provide a way in which we can actually get a handle on the on these critical issues that are affecting everywhere worldwide. It's just that they're not as extreme as we see in islands. So I think Evan, maybe you can just talk a little bit about the specific issues that that we're dealing with in, in these systems. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, I, I think what Rosie was, was, was emphasizing is that islands make a, I think one of the reasons they really have had a lot of attention from biologists is they're, they're like a natural laboratory. So when we're interested in things that are happening on the scale of uh, continents, I mean, sometimes they're not fundamentally different than what's happening on islands. It's just islands are, are, are simpler and more tractable, tractable systems, and there's some measure of replication. So we can see what happens in different cases. Um, and so that's true for, say, understanding natural selection, but it's also true for understanding what's happening with all the, the, the global changes and impacts. And so I wanna highlight a, a few uh, of the main threats. I mean, you've probably all heard of these uh, to some extent um, and, and how they're impacting uh, islands. So um, the first is habitat destruction. I mean, that, that uh, humans, of course, modify habitats wherever we go. And that's happened uh, since the, the early humans arriving on all of these islands. This first photo here on the top uh, left is a, is a photo I took in Fiji. And you can see it's lo lo looking out over a landscape um, that would have been all forest, but is now mostly sugar plantations. So a complete transformation of the landscape. And although this happens everywhere in the world, this is a huge actual fraction of the land on these islands. So there really is just not much land left. Um, you can see in the in the second photo, second column on the left, on, on the left, there is a land cover image of Okinawa. Um, Okinawa has also uh, a lot of uh, forest degradation, particularly the, the southern part of the island, um, and whereas the northern part of the island is, is less impacted. Um, and then in the bottom, you can see a nice, uh, you know, more on the ground photo of what happens when forest gets converted to pasture. And so the actual you know, of course, this changes dramatically all the species living there, all the ecosystem processes. And, you know, the areas we're talking about are so, so small that you have so many species that exist nowhere else really live them. They're limited to very, very small areas. Um, so for those of you from the U.S., you know, o Okinawa has less area than one county of, say, North Carolina, where I'm from. Uh, it's just a very small amount of area for species uh, to, to persist in. And also it, that, of course, impacts the sustainability of human populations and uh, that, that need natural resources as well. So that, uh, people will ex exhaust the local natural resources much more quickly on islands. The second you know, category, if you will, is, of course, climate change, um, huge uh, problem around the world. Um, with CO2 enrichment, we have rising temperatures. Um, the, the most obvious way that may affect islands is through rising sea levels. So many islands in the Pacific are simply going to disappear, um, particularly low-lying coral atolls. But um, of course, coastal impacts even for islands like Hawaii that, that have much larger uh, elevational ranges. I mean, Hawaii is not going to be submerged, but the coastal areas are going to be heavily impacted by sea level change. And, and on islands, it's going to be even more of an impact than what you get on continental areas, which is already going to be huge. Um, and then, you know, the other one is that rising temperatures and changing climate um, is going to affect species everywhere. Each species has some environmental tolerance that they're adapted to. Um, and one problem we're worried about around the world is when that environmental tolerance moves and uh, can species track with it. And in, on many islands, there really isn't anywhere for species to go. There may be specialists on higher elevation habitats, higher on a, uh, on a mountain. For example, the, the species living on the high mountains of Hawaii 
you know, if it warms up, that actually they may be pushed out and not be able to disperse somewhere else and not be able to survive. So it's a very potentially uh, uh, dangerous uh, situation for species on these islands that again have some of the smallest ranges in the world. Um, so the, the, the third uh, big category I'd say is uh, that we can see dramatically happening right now is invasive species. So maybe George, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about invasive species? Well, these are uh, three really interesting kinds of examples here. Um, in the upper right there, you see a, a, a large ship and shipping containers. And uh, these, these are just uh, uh, crucibles for uh, invasions um, in, in many ways. You've probably heard about ballast water, which, you know, the big ships um, uh, control how they sit in the water by pumping water in and out. And uh, historically, uh, this was done right in harbors or just outside of harbors. And of course, pumping critters in and pumping critters out on the other side when they get somewhere uh, is a very easy way for things to get around. And in fact, the San Francisco Bay that you probably know about in which is near us, um, almost all the organisms in the San Francisco Bay now come from somewhere else as a result of ballast water. More recently, um, regulations have, have um, insisted that uh, ships um, flush their ballast water when they're still farther out into the ocean. And so this is less of a problem, but the impact is still there. Also on ships, there are fouling communities on the sides of, of uh, ships uh, like, like here and um, you know, all, all the big ocean vessels that move around, organisms attach themselves to boats and, and um, then are, are easily dispersed to um, docks and, and other places. And this is a big problem in the, in the Pacific. And then of course, there's what's on, those, on these ships and their containers. Um, you know, organisms can move around um, in, as uh, horticultural plants or associated with horticultural plants or with uh, food and fiber that, that we move around. Um, there are also organisms that come with us as, as humans in, in our own activities, and uh, one of those, uh, one large group is ants. And Evan, you should probably explain the importance of their uh, imported fire ant. But ants, ants generally are uh, masters of invasive invasions, and um, they just get everywhere. Evan, do you want to explain that one? Yeah, sure. So. Um... Yeah, I'm a big fan of ants, but they are a bit of a problem when it comes to when they're brought accidentally by humans. And uh, they're definitely a huge problem in the Pacific Islands as well. Uh, ants don't actually naturally get out to the, the really remote Pacific, such as Hawaii, don't have native ants. So what happens is those ecosystems there are, are somewhat naive. We would say they don't, they're not used to having these species here. So when we bring them accidentally, they can cause a lot of damage and, uh, and, and do, uh, you know, uh, have all kinds of bad effects. So if you come here, but they're, they're everywhere too. If you come on our campus here at OIST or anywhere around city, the cities, the developed areas in Okinawa, all the ants you'll encounter are generally not from Okinawa, they're from Africa or South America or somewhere quite far away and they've been brought here accidentally. Um, and some of them can be extremely damaging. Uh, one of them that we worry about a lot is the red imported fire ant. Um, if any of you have lived in the Southern US, you're probably aware of that one. Um, and it's in Hawaii, it's causing a lot of problems in Hawaii. And it's been arriving in Japan recently. Fortunately, we don't have really established populations in Japan yet but it's all around us. It's in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And we're very worried about it coming here to Okinawa. So we've, we've been, part of our research here is trying to develop um, early warning surveillance systems and countermeasures so that we can detect these species. So just for reference, I mean, this species causes about $13 billion damage every year in the United States to just this one species. And so it can be very problematic for economics and human health. And I think if you go to um, um, maybe, I don't know, Rosie, do you want to talk about this other picture we have there with the ginger? Well, um, yeah. Oh, could I just, could I just yeah. add something about the sure. ant? So um, just a, a tidbit that um, the ant biologists of the world are very well connected. And we'll talk about data science in a, in a little while. But the ants are, are, have sort of become a model for how researchers can share information and, uh, online and create keys and taxonomic uh, tools 
so that researchers around the world can uh, understand um, uh, ants and their biology and also trace their uh, distributions and understand their threats. And uh, Evan is part of this uh, group of ant biologists who have uh, worked very closely together uh, um, internationally to, to make these um, you know, data repositories uh, available. So that bottom slide, Rosie's going to comment on, this is one of her field sites in Hawaii. Yeah, the, the thing, I mean, ants are, are super important, we should say. There, there's just certain key things on these islands that are, are just, you know, the, they're, they're just the plague. <laughs> I remember giving a talk about that and, and an ant biologist gave me a really hard time. He said, not all ants are a plague. But um, there are other things that are also just um, that, that, that you really don't like to see on the islands. And I just wanted to highlight this one on the bottom right, which is, as George said, it was a, it's one of my study sites in, in Maui. And it, it's just at the border of, of the, the Nature Conservancy's Waikamai Preserve. And what you see there is actually a fence going kind of through the middle. To the left of the fence is an invasion of ginger that is modifying the the whole habitat. The the ginger is just a, a this dense stand, and nothing nothing can really do anything underneath it. It's just a, this solid mass of invasive ginger. When you say, "Well, is the fence keeping it out?" because there's the, it's, there's very little in the in the preserve, and no, it's just the very diligent efforts of the staff of the Nature Conservancy. And of course, you know, you go, if you walk just 100 yards ahead, you come to a gulch and the ginger has flooded up the gulch. And you think, well, what's the future of these habitats if it's just being so devastated by this invasive? And that's not the only one. There are many others. And this is what we really need to get a handle on if we're going to understand what's happening in the islands. And a good, a good point about that ginger example is it's transforming the whole uh, ecosystem. I mean, uh, as a result of the ginger, there are different uh, arthropods that feed on it. It's uh, influencing the, the groundwater and the hydrology of the watershed. So these um, seemingly innocuous species can have uh, just huge impacts. Yeah, so so thank you. The um, so we've we've talked a lot about the threats and all the sort of bad things happening, but uh, we should move on to you know what actually can we do about this and what um, how can we address some of these problems? And I think uh, you know I would say that one of the big problems we've had is that it's really hard to actually track what's going on in these ecosystems when it comes to biodiversity in particular. You know how can we know what is really happening to say the insect community in Hawaii where it involves thousands of species potentially um, changing over time and you know traditionally the traditional way we monitor these things uh, or the way we we detect what, what's happening is very slow involves a lot of manual work and 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 we have to focus on one group at a time so but there are some really exciting new technologies that we're trying to leverage um, to, 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 to try to more high throughput and more automatic way to monitor ecosystems. So one big one we're going to talk about is DNA sequencing. So um, th th this has been something we've all been working on, but uh, you know, instead of going out with my field guide to try to identify every single uh, uh, species I can find in an ecosystem, one approach we can do now is actually sequence the DNA either from large groups of samples or from the environment itself, like soil or, uh, or different areas, and look for small snippets of DNA that are characteristic of a given species. So we build a library of what species, well, we call this DNA barcoding, which is similar to an analogy to say a grocery store where every product has a little bar barcode. And then you can say, go get a bunch of soil and just look for these small snippets of DNA that, that indicate that, oh, this fire ant is actually in this ecosystem or this uh, other kind of plant. And so that's a really powerful, we're just really getting a handle on how we can um, leverage that data. And we'll talk about that next. Um, another area we have is, is uh, remote sensing. So we have all kinds of wonderful satellite and aerial instruments that are taking data um, and often repeated data, temporal data that we can uh, examine what's happening on islands. Uh, Ecoacoustics, that's another uh, thing, one thing we're doing here in Okinawa, which is um, actually to take sound recordings. There's a lot of information in sound uh, 
um, in the noises that different animals make and what and different uh, human originating noises. And we can record, for example, uh, for 24 seven, of course, we need to use computational techniques like machine learning to actually go in and say, well, how, when did we detect this bird that we're interested in um, across, you know, this whole year, year's worth of a recording. A similar type of approach, camera and video. So we, we, we've had camera traps and video traps for a while, but we can also now use machine learning and image analysis to identify things automatically. Um, so that is cool. Another one I, I really like, a, it is a radar. So this is actually an image of radar from Okinawa. And you can see that big blue mass that sort of starts on the top left on the island and then sort of takes off and moves to the right. And that is uh, migratory birds that are all taking off um, around the early, you know, early hours of the day. Um, so we catch a lot of different insects and, and birds and everything on radar. And, and it's a great way to monitor actually declines or, or the, the overall populations that we have. Um, and finally, yeah, the, all of this is powered by uh, informatics advances and computational advances and machine learning that we can use to um, get more out of these big data um, that we have, if you will. Um, so going back to the, we want to go back a little bit to the DNA sequencing uh, part because that's something we're working on intensively. Rosie, do you want to talk about what what, what, you, what can you do with that kind of analysis? Yeah, um, and if we go to the next slide, David, um, what we uh, I'll just highlight kind of the rough idea of what we've been doing. the the point The point here is that we need to understand communities. So what is going on in a community? What is it? Is it in steady state? Is it really? Is it disturbed? Is it going through a tipping point? And so, to do that, what we are trying to get, <clears throat> what we're, we're trying to get metrics of abundance and diversity, as well as networks and interactions, and hence develop ideas of resilience to invasion, vulnerability, and to to get at these metrics, we have to get an understanding of entire communities. And so this is a project I, I started um, almost a decade ago. And um, the idea is that we sample quantitatively um, across a habitat. If you look at the, the bottom right picture, you see that kind of diagrammatic, this is not a, a tropical island forest, but it gives you an idea of how we sample. We, we have a broad set of sampling protocols and, and we set up traps for a given time or, or beat a plant for a given time to get at interactions. But um, what happens when you do that is you get a mess of arthropods and you end up with thousands, millions of, of vials that look like this picture in the middle at the bottom. And so we um, spent many years sorting through these, these samples until Finally, I, I had a postdoc who was visiting from Germany and was very pragmatic about this and um, said, you know, he'd love to, to help out. And I said, well, we just need to sort the specimens. And so he basically timed me without actually telling me. Um, so he timed me how long I was taking to sort it. And, and he, he said, you know, at this rate, well, I was trying to go fast. And at this rate, he said, at this rate, it's going to take you 40 years to, to do this. And so this is when we realized that to do this kind of approach, you have to use a different, you have to do things differently. And so as Evan said, the approach that we're using is something that's that's still very, it's a, very much in its youth. It's um, DNA metabarcoding, where you take these bulk samples and you just sequence them. And using various technologies, um, you have to sort to size, you have to bioinformatically separate to, to, to order, but using those kinds of um, finaglings of, of the data, you can actually extract both abundance and diversity from this, this data and representing the entire, this is specifically for arthropods, but representing the entire community. So you can look at things like, you know, what are the abundance distributions within this environment? And if they're, they're off kilter, it means that there's something going on that shouldn't be going on in the, in the environment, whether it's invasion, disruption, and, and at the same 
same time, what we want to do is figure out how networks of interactions are changing. You know, the, the beetles associated with the plant or, or the spider feeding on an insect. How are those interactions, these food webs changing? You expect in, in either disturbed or very new communities that the networks would be looser and more open to invasion. Is that true? That's exactly what we're trying to get at. And if we can get at these metrics, what we hope is to be able to get at some signature of how resilient these communities are and hence how vulnerable they are to invasion and what we can do about it. So that's basically what we're, um, what we've been doing. And if we go to the next slide, I just want to highlight here, what we can do is goes beyond the bounds of simply, you know, looking at biodiversity, we can connect with all other, our, other attributes of, of the island community. And George is gonna just explain a little bit about what they've been doing in, in Tahiti. So this is uh, the island of Morea, which is the sister island to uh, Tahiti. And, um, uh, several years ago, uh, we collaborated with our colleague Neil Davies um, to work with uh, uh, researchers from many different disciplines to um, inventory the entire island and to, um, you know, get a, a, a representative um, uh, uh, reference library for all the organisms on this island. And what we realized was that, of, of course, you know, our biodiversity that we're sampling is is not in a vacuum, and um, the what we're observing and the impacts we're seeing uh, have social consequences. And so, the biodiversity and um, uh, social sciences are are really uh, coupled on islands, and islands are a place where it's possible to to make these connections and see these connections. And this is not an easy thing to do because you, you know people who look at economies and who study fishing um, uh, measure uh, sustainability and measure uh, outcomes in a very different way than than we do as uh, as terrestrial ecologists. And so, uh, a, a project currently on the island of Morea is is attempting to try to um, um, couple these disciplines so that we can make predictions about um, uh, long term uh, sustainability. And this is uh, somewhat reminiscent of this concept that uh, Polynesians in Hawaii had, the Ahu Pu'a'a concept, where they envisioned uh, these ecosystems linked from uh, the mountaintops to the to near shore. And uh, they developed a sustainable management system uh, that coupled uh, these different kinds of uh, ways of looking at, at life and uh, the biology of, of islands. And we see this today too. Uh, for example, recently and a few years ago, there was a Zika outbreak on the island of, of French Polynesia uh, as it moved around the world. Um, and uh, at that time, um, when um, the local people were uh, contracting, uh, contacting, or uh, um, being infected by Zika, uh, there was a, a, a large impact on the um, um, on the fish populations uh, near shore and offshore uh, as they changed their livelihoods um, when they couldn't um, go to work and, and uh, you know, conduct business as they usually do. So it's, it's very clear that you know, what we're monitoring um, and what we're trying to get a handle on uh, in the terrestrial systems has um, impacts that, that are very connected to livelihoods, um, not only in terrestrial systems, but uh, the marine systems as well. Okay, uh, thank you. So I'm cognizant of the time. So I just want to mention a little bit what we're doing in um, Okinawa. So we, we had a, some years ago, um, started a project called the Okian Chudamori project. So Chudamori means beautiful forest in Okinawan dialect. And what the idea here was really a collaboration with OIST scientists and the different communities and stakeholders around Okinawa to set up a an observation network where we have 24 sites taking data con continuously across the island. It's a lot of the different data types we've been talking about. So arthropods, camera traps, acoustic recorder, and also climate. Um, and we work closely with schools and museums um, to do that. And so the idea here is that in 10 years or 20 years, we can actually have, just like we track the stock market, we, we, we can track what's happening to really important aspects of uh, Okinawa's ecosystems, and also uh, monitor for the presence of 
for example, new invasive species or damaging invasive species that may not be easy to detect uh, 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 quickly otherwise. And it's been a really good project for us to make connections with Okinawan communities as well. We have a lot of, for example, you see here high school groups, the top photo are high school teachers being trained in insect collection, and then they work with their classes, which you see uh, below there is one, one, one of our ant, uh, ant teams. Uh, so this is a group of students who did a project. And actually, the, the students around Okinawa have generated some really interesting data about where different species are and, and what they're doing. So um, that's been a, a big project we had at OIST. And, and actually, um, Rosie mentioned her, her project in Hawaii and George's project. What we've been doing recently in the last couple of years is trying to link up different efforts across the Pacific. Um, and we have this new project we call, just sort of informally call it Island Scanner, which is trying to apply particularly these DNA meta barcoding methods across islands across the Pacific. So we, we have collaborators working in the Ogasawara Islands, uh, Guam and the Marianas, Hawaii Society Islands, and of course we want to expand to many others. Um, and so we did some field work across the Pacific last year um, where we tried to sample with similar methods and, and really do um, in a high throughput way, um, use these new data tools to analyze what, what's happening in ecosystems. And uh, you know, th this is gonna have a, um, we, we recently got a grant. George, do you wanna mention the project that we're, we're just starting up now? Uh, oh, oh we, we recently applied for funding from a group called CERTIP that um, combines uh, research exp expertise in, in the Department of Defense, um, the EPA and Department of Energy. And um, this project uh, will use these same tools on different islands uh, to try to uh, understand the role of, of invasive species, especially arthropods for us, uh, and the extent to which they are um, part of the, the, the biota um, in terrestrial ecosystems. Yeah, and so what we want to be able to do, and this is driven a lar large part by the military not wanting to you know, spread around invasive species. And we want to be able to say swab a vehicle or, um, and, or pick up a bit of soil on a base and know, OK, is there anything here uh, nearby that is potentially damaging that, that we need to know about? Um, and you can make that much more rapid than we, and accesses lots of species that we can't easily otherwise uh, track. So, uh, so that's so we're hoping to to grow this sort of U.S. Japan collaboration uh, uh, and uh, and do more work across the Pacific. So I think that's that's all we have for the the sort of uh, art part of it. Um, if we'd be happy to, David, do we have some time for sort of questions and discussion? We do. Uh, thank thank you all so much for that incredibly rich presentation. Uh, and all of these insights. Uh, we have a few questions, so um, maybe I'll uh, just jump right into them. And, and I'll also let the audience know that uh, if you have some additional questions, please uh, feel free to write them in chat. The first question, um, which maybe should go to you, Rosemary, but uh, whoever wants to jump at it is, uh, do the volcanic soils and large elevation range <coughs> Hawaiian islands mean that they are more susceptible to erosion as climate change persists? Um, that's a really interesting question. So, um, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a hard one to answer. I know in Tahiti, um, the, the, a major effect there has been um, that you've got an invasion of Myconia, which is a, another invasive um, plant that looks like like ginger, but but actually it's it's in a different group altogether. But but it, what what it does is it it takes over the landscape and and um, it has shallow. It's fast growing, but has shallow roots, and because of that, it has kind of a, a it doesn't have as much grip on the soil, and so there have been major landslides associated with with um, myconia. Um, in terms of you know land things that you might find you know landslides that you can associate um, with climate change, you know the thing is we I think the biggest the biggest concern really that we can actually detect and understand is invasive species in in Hawaii. At the moment, it's really hard to 
um, pick up direct signatures of climate change. Obviously, they feed into each other. They're they're interacting, but it's it's a tough one to say. I'd be guessing if I said that that um, that they're more susceptible to erosion as climate change persists. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, we have another um, really interesting question that's just come in. Please share with us a best practice that you have found in one island that had uh, applicability elsewhere, thereby highlighting the importance of collaboration among the various regions. Who wants to take a stab at that? Maybe Evan can... can. <laughs> um, well, the, I mean, there's many, I think, um, you know, I think there's many examples. Um, the, you know, on the invasive species front, I think the Pacific Island nations have worked strongly with New, New Zealand and Australia to um, develop a lot of, I mean, it's far from where I think we'd all want it to be, but it, it's quite impressive how much they've coordinated, shared information, and they have uh, species monitoring systems at different ports. Um, there, there's a lot of good examples of conservation. I know in Fiji, there were some really nice conservation uh, uh, efforts where they really worked with local communities to develop a marine protected area, but also have it um, work well with the local villages, uh, sort of economic interests and develop ecotourism and things like that. I mean, in Okinawa, I mean, they've there's been a lot of progress. I mean, one big issue in Okinawa is the red soil. We have a lot of red soil runoff that goes into the ocean um, and uh, impacts the reefs. And, you know, they, 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 I think, made a lot of progress from the, the laws, you know, uh, and there's an ordinance that, that, that uh, can, um, that reduced that a lot in the last 20, 25 years. And, um, and I think a lot of these local lessons, I think, do course, uh, translate. I mean, I think it's a bit of a, we'd have to talk more specific about one of those domains, I think, but, um, you know, particularly the Pacific Island nations, I think, do a, a good job of sharing a lot of, they share a lot of the same challenges and issues and, um, and can share useful information. George or Rosemary, anything you want to add to that? You can go ahead, Judge. Oh, I think I, I, I would second that, that the, the island nations are, are very well connected um, culturally uh, as well as you know, scientifically. And uh, there's a lot of exchange of information. Um, a lot of this is uh, uh, in, in often relates to the, the shared heritage and um, uh, the historical understanding of, of resources and, and problems. Um, I remember recently uh, being in, in French Polynesia, and this crown of thorn starfish was uh, um, was eating everything on the on the reef and increasing in, in numbers. And the um, the local fishermen there had had remembered that you know it had been there um, decades before, and uh, sort of had a um, it was experiencing kind of an outbreak, um, and then it would quite likely. Uh, disappear and you know this kind of information is, is shared and uh, communicated uh, often not in the scientific literature but but uh, culturally um, because of the people who uh, live there and their connections on on in other islands and other island nations thanks so much for that um, a different question uh, which is about uh, DNA, uh, and your discussion on um, using that. Uh, the question is, how can environmental DNA be used to determine population abundance in contrast to presence or absence? So Maybe this is, there? this is- uh, an Rosie will give you a lecture on this one. <laughs> yeah. We only have about four minutes left. So. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that- This is something we've been working very, very hard on. And someone else asked about, you know, we may not be able to travel to research sites. What are we, you know, we, so, so we haven't been able to, and 
we've been finessing these kinds of approaches while we've been stuck in one place. And so the, the, it's an issue. The whole, the, this is the huge issue in, in meta barcoding, this kind of approach that I mentioned, getting abundance data, because you badly need abundance data if you're going to get at estimates such as the, the abundance distributions or, or food web networks, changes in diversity, beta diversity, alpha diversity. However, the big issue with, with metabarcoding or eDNA is that it is the, the big factors that dictate how many actual reads, as we call them, how many reads you get out depends on the amount of material that you put in and how well the, the primer that the, the, the anyway the, how well the primer binds so the, the so but the first thing depends then on size if you can control for size so separate out your the the specimens by size then you you can you can really ameliorate that bias secondly if you can bioinformatically to control for order at least you can largely take care of the issue of of binding bias where, where the primer doesn't bind as well in some groups as in others and so you can control for these two effects both you know by, by sorting the your specimens to size which is very quick and bioinformatically by separating them by order it's not perfect but it works really uh, really very well indeed and um yeah that was a perfect question to ask because it's one of the things that we've really been working on very very hard well, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks for the question. Uh, we, we could do a whole webinar, it seems, on that topic, um, which would be really interesting. Uh, uh, well, there's a, there's a quick question for you, Rosemary. The photo behind you looks like Maui. Uh, if so, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually, light, light, this, so, so it's, it's actually Mauna Loa. Um, as far as I, I recall, <laughs> I think it's Mauna Loa from Mauna Kea. I think Ken, Ken Kaneshiro is on the call as well. And so, so Ken can perhaps correct me if I'm wrong here. I, I'm a little bit hesitant to say now, but uh, um, I'm pretty sure it's one of the ones we took. So I should know where it is, um, but it just makes me feel like I'm out there. <laughs> exactly. And I've got oyster behind me and um... Uh, yes, the, the new world we live in. Um, hey, uh, Evan, there's a question for you uh, by a, a, a participant here asking if uh, you use the NASA GLOBE tools in support of your Okeon citizen science effort. Yeah, so we, we haven't uh, used that particular tool. One, um, there are lots of good citizen science programs and school programs uh, around the world. But one, one issue we do have, which is just related to our capacity is of course, we, we need to do everything in Japanese. So um, any kind of program like that, we would need to translate all the materials and, um, and, and, and everything. So, but I'm always interested to, to hear and look, and look at these different ones. Um, there'd, there'd be a lot of, uh, you know, there would be a lot of opportunity for something like that, but um, we, we do need, we do have this, you know, just makes everything a bit more difficult if we have to translate back and forth. I mean, one, one thing that is a little bit different with our project in Okinawa is we don't, um, it's not necessarily about collecting a standard set of data that say we designed as researchers, but we try to give the students sort of the tools for how to do a certain kind of collection of data and let them design, design their own project. And because that's what classes in Okinawa, the, the students have science competitions. And so they, they really design their own project, although they collect sort of units of data that we can then put together that, is, uh, that adds up to a useful data set um, for us and also the, the material. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested in any, uh, any of these programs that does seem uh, good. Thank you for that. Uh, there's one uh, uh, participant who's from Saipan in the Marianas uh, and is just uh, commenting how helpful and uh, great this presentation is. So uh, thank you for that. Let, let me ask one final question from one participant and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna ask each of you for maybe some final remarks before we sadly have to go. An hour just passes like that. Um, but one uh, interesting question has come in here. How do you discount effects of anthropogenic stressors when trying to establish a baseline or a survey of an ecosystem, such as the Morea project. 
George, I don't know if you want to take that or, or someone else, but I wonder if you have some brief comments on that uh, final question for. Well, it, it, this is uh, what's what's a baseline? Well, it, it can be very difficult. Sometimes uh, you'll have um, parts of an island or a habitat where it's undisturbed and uh, parts where it is disturbed and you can sort of treat that as a natural experiment. Um, it's, it's more difficult to know, you know, what was there before the Polynesians came. Um, and there are uh, ways uh, researchers are, are looking at what's in the soil and what's um, beneath the layers, um, you know, uh, that were uh, deposited with Polynesian communities and the fires that followed and, and so on. And so it, there, there are ways to, to figure out, um, you know, what, what was there bef before humans. Um, often we just have to rely on time sequences. So we start sampling uh, in one decade and we can follow uh, communities through for several decades and, and look at um, change. But it's, it's very difficult to, to you know, know what it was like um, in previous years. Great question. And maybe I can, I was actually just gonna, can I just add to that? Um, that, that in the Hawaiian project, we've chosen sites that have standard elevations, so around 35,000, 3,500 feet, that look like they're native. They're dominated by metrosiderous forest and have no obvious invasive species. The thing is, the metabarcoding approach is actually showing that there are more non natives than we actually thought. Um, so it's, it's a tricky one, and that was just an, an excellent question. Well, we, we have to wrap up, but let me ask each of you uh, if you have a final message uh, or brief comment you'd like to leave the audience with, uh, maybe something about um, you know, the particular uh, reason they should be concerned about this or something they should do or something that's just on your mind after this presentation. And um, Rosemary, I wonder if I could start with you. Uh, quick final message. So I think, uh, I mean, my main message is that, th that we need to act, we need to act right away. And, you know, what, what is surprising in other places in the world is that there's a lot of emphasis on climate change, which there should be, it's a major issue. But what I've said to, to people in California, when they, when they, you know, we say, you know, we, we need to focus on this problem. And I say, well, you know, it's climate change is a huge issue, but it's it's like sitting on a bridge and worrying about the water coming up when actually there's a train coming right at you. This is an immediate problem and we need to get our act together and really do something, understand what's going on and and really do something about it. And so What's exciting about this work is the ability we're, we're coming together. You know, I've loved looking at the chat and seeing everyone, you know, just talking together. And it's, it's like a family here and we can work together and actually solve this problem. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Evan. Yeah, so um, just want to echo what, what they've already said. I mean, I think, uh, again, I mean, the, the intro, I hope it's clear that you know, we, we are fascinated by islands and they're really important in their own right. But one of the main also interests is that we see sort of in microcosm what's happening around the world happen in islands quicker and more, more intensively. So um, that's, you know, a really important reason why we should care what's happening on these really small uh, uh, land masses uh, because it can help us um, understand what's happening and also field test all these new ways to monitor things and 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 uh, you know my what I hope we'll have by the time I'm you know 20 years 30 years down the line is some kind of weather stations for biodiversity all over the world that we, we can actually tr like we track climate and weather we can track what's happening to species out there and what's happening to other aspects of the ecosystem. And right now we just don't have that. I and mean, we've all heard about insect declines and in the news and the insect apocalypse, but we don't really know most places. We don't, if you ask me what's happened to insects in Okinawa in the last 30 years, I just don't know, you know? And so, um, and so we, I, I hope you get the impression that, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but it's hopeful because we have a lot of new tools and new uh, technologies that we can hopefully uh, uh, leverage and and really uh, get a handle on this problem. 
but yeah, we need to work together. And I think it's a great topic for US-Japan collaboration and, uh, and OIST as well. Um, and of course, all these different uh, uh, island nations across the Pacific. Thank you. I, I love that. Weather stations for biodiversity. It's fabulous. Um, George. So I was going to say, too, that we're, we're all in this together. I think Rose, Rosemary and Evan have said that, but we are in this together. And there are also many opportunities for all of us to participate and, and be involved. You know, as Rosie said, you know, now's the time for action. And researchers can do what they do, um, but there are also opportunities for, for everybody to, to be involved uh, through you know, local citizen science projects or um, you know, volunteering in, in different ways. And um, you, you know, it's, it's really through all of our activities that, that we can make a difference. Well, thank you for that. I, I'm, you know, one of the things that just impresses me with all three of you is just your deep passion uh, for what you do. It just, it comes across and I, I think everyone uh, who's joining us tonight can feel that. Um, and so I really thank you for uh, your time and, and insights. And I thank the audience for taking their time to join us and sticking with us. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll draw this to a close. Let me just say a few final things. I, I really wanna thank uh, the Japan Foundation again for supporting uh, this webinar. Um, I also wanna thank uh, UC Berkeley's Department of Environmental uh, Science Policy um, and Management for all of their support. Uh, and I want to let the audience know that if you go to oistfoundation.org, oistfoundation.org, you can find out about uh, the next two webinars in this series. Uh, the next one will be on December 9th at 7 p.m., focused on, uh, that's Eastern time in the U.S., and that will be focused on oceans and climate change. And on December 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, will be the third of the three webinars, and that will be focused on innovation to uh, mitigate climate change. Uh, so I hope you can join us for those as well. Uh, and again, if you go to oistfoundation.org, you'll be able to sign up and, and register for those. Uh, with that, uh, thank you all again so very much for being with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Evan, George, and Rosemary um, for your incredible insights and time. Uh, and I wish everyone a great evening or a good day uh, to those of you in Japan. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yes. Thanks so much to everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs>